You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. This message was recorded live at our Chester campus. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. Well, we uh, are landing a series today called The Big Questions of Life. Who's enjoyed this? Kind of getting a little bit deeper, kind of, you know, uh, getting our brains thinking. And really, let me just say that in the 25 or 24 minutes and one second that we have, right, on these Sundays, we cannot cover these uh, these kind of topics in the full extent. This is literally whetting your appetite, kind of opening the lid, helping us a little bit more. Um, so, you know, you guys have got to go away, take it away, read stuff, research, ask Lee and Lizandri questions. Come and ask them the really, really tough ones, okay? Um, but brilliant. Well, today we are looking at, you know, this really, just really easy subject, okay? <laughs> the easy subject of why does bad stuff happen to good people? So I reckon, you know, we've all had those days, those days that just kind of just do not start well, don't they? Where, and it usually starts when you press uh, stop on your phone instead of snooze. Not good because then you are running late. And then, you know, your morning then proceeds to be, you know, a little bit chaotic and everything happens from, you know, I don't know, child gets dressed in one uniform and then realizes it's Tuesday and it's not normal uniform, it's PE uniform today. So they have to go and get dressed. Everyone's rushing around. I'm making uh, packed lunches for people only to realize, oh no, I've ordered everyone's school dinners. You know, that'll have to be for tea. You kind of like doing all these things. We have this thing in our house where we have to take one of uh, our children. They're all in different schools, not very well organized. Three kids, three different schools, you know, three different drop-offs, and one of them requires us to drive him to the bus. But if we're running late, then we have to play this little game called chase the school bus. So, you know, you're kind of like trying to chase the bus. It's going down here, you like cut this corner, you know, and sometimes it works. And sometimes if you fail, you have to drive all the way to school. Drive of shame. But, you know, the chaos of the morning can go like that. And then you finally get home to make yourself a brew and realize there's no milk. Do you know what I mean? Like those kind of days. We've all had those kind of days where things do not go to plan. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. We love this verse, don't we? I reckon there's a lot of us here who are like, yes, this is my life first. It gives me the warm fuzzies. We love it. We're like, this is so good. We love it loads. The problem is, is that what happens in life when this verse does not match our reality? When we have the bad mornings that I just described, which I'm sure it's not just me, I'm sure you have those in your households too. Um, you know, and we have challenges and different trials and the things kind of come at us. And this verse can seem anything like God has a good plan for us. Anything like that, you know, there's a hope and a future. And I know in this room, there'll be people who have walked through, you know, not just days like I was just talking about, they're like at best, they're just inconvenient, right? But I'm talking about the real tough stuff of life. We've walked through real hard challenges, heartbreaking situations. We've walked through loss and grief. We've experienced disappointment. We've gone through relationship breakdown. We've had to face financial challenges as families. Many of us in this room will have uh, experienced different levels of challenge, different levels of where you feel like, God, I'm good, but what I'm experiencing is pretty bad. I want you to say that this has been going on for many years. We look at our heroes in the Bible, in the Word of God, and they are not just having these like, you know, great time either. When you read about David, he says, For troubles without number surround me. My sins have overtaken me. I cannot see. There are more than the hairs on my head and my heart fails within me. Jeremiah, he says in chapter 15, Why is my pain unending, my wound grievous and incurable? If God is all-powerful, then why doesn't he remove suffering? If God is all-loving, then why am I experiencing this pain? If God is good, if his plans are for good, if his plans are not for harm, then why does bad stuff happen to good people? 
And the truth is, is that in this room, that none of us are exempt from this. None of us are exempt from the, char- the trials and the challenges of life and what life can throw at us. Doesn't matter your education, doesn't matter your financial status, doesn't matter how good your intentions are or how good you are. Bad stuff can still happen to good people. And I, I guess I want to set kind of a, just a benchmark of a common you know, kind of an idea before we jump into this a little bit more of two things that I want us to kind of think about. First is this, is that God is not logical. God is not logical. We cannot put God into a little box. If we could put God in a box, he wouldn't be God. Isaiah 55 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. He's not logical. We cannot put God in a box. And the second thing is this, is that we need faith in his goodness where we cannot comprehend. I love this quote from Bill Johnson. It says this, His goodness is beyond our ability to comprehend, but not beyond our ability to experience. Our hearts will take us where our heads can't fit. I love that, and I just want you to hold that uh, in your thoughts as we kind of go through this. Okay, we're going to look at four things about bad stuff, okay? And you're going to have to help me because this is a lot of stuff to say, okay? Um, So the first thing is this, is that bad stuff happens because the world is broken. In our household, there's probably two ways we view things, um, and I'll let you decide who that is in our marriage. One of us goes with the idea, um, it's best to go with prevention, okay? Like preventing things. And the other one would sit on the other side of the fence, which is a bit more like crisis management. You know, so we deal with the crisis, you know, when it's happening. So, you know, when there's things that kind of like have a little, little, just a little drip kind of coming out from the, you know, the back of your bathroom or something, you're thinking, okay, that needs fixing. We need to fix this now so that we can prevent anything further happening. And it's like, no, 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 I'll be fine. Until there is like a waterfall coming through from your ceiling into your hallway. And then, you know, the crisis management kicks in. If something is broken, it doesn't matter how much you try and fix it, but how much you try and patch it up, at some point, it's going to leak. At some point, something is, you know, it cannot be contained. It's going to step out. Bad stuff happens because the world is broken. We have to go back to the beginning to kind of really understand this. So in the beginning, uh, God created his perfect world. His perfect world, it was full of calm and order. There were systems and seasons. There's timings and patterns. And, you know, it was good. God says in the word of God, it says it was good. So he had a perfect world. And he then decided to put in his perfect world, perfect man. Uh, We know that because it says it's created in the image of God. So now we have a perfect world with a perfect uh, man and woman, Adam and Eve. I'm sure you've heard of them. And so everything is good. Everything's great. And God says, um, you know, that he wants to, he's done this because he wants to love on his creation. He wants to take pleasure. Just as a parent that you, you know, you dote on your child and you love to watch them. God created us for his pleasure. But he also created us. At us to love him. He wanted us to, him to love us and us to love him. And in order to do that, he had to give us free will. See, love is not love if it's not a choice. So he had to give us free will. And that's important. So everything was going great. And he said, you can do anything. Enjoy this perfect world I've created, but just don't eat from this tree over here. Okay, this one over here, don't touch that. The trouble is, is that Adam and Eve, uh, they were deceived by the, the serpent. And unfortunately, they, they did. They ate the apple off the tree that God said, don't touch. And it was in that moment, in that moment where they disobeyed God, that sin entered the world. There was now separation from a loving father to his children. There was now a gap and God's perfect world was broken. It says in Romans 5, 12, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all had sinned. In the NLT, it says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread for everyone, for everyone sinned. Great verse. 
But it is from this moment that we live in the consequences of a broken and a fractured world. So we look at the things that we experience, the, the floods, the, the earthquakes, the tsunamis, the hurricane. These are not a result of an angry God, but they're a byproduct of a broken world. And we've termed these things, um, you know, natural disasters. But God is there thinking, these are anything but natural. These are unnatural because this was not my intention in the perfect world that I created. It's just that now the world is fractured and the world is broken. There's bad stuff, but there is a good God. And the good thing is, is that God created a plan. His plan was called Jesus. So he sent Jesus to come and restore, to come and redeem that which was broken. So right now we live in a temporary, remember this is just a world we're passing through, right? So this is a temporary world we're living in that is broken. But this isn't the finished product because God says that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth where things will not be broken, where things are made perfect again. And it says in 2 Peter, and this is what we can hold to, guys. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So why does bad stuff happen to good people? Firstly, it's because the world is broken. Second thing is this. Bad stuff happens because people make choices. People make choices. I reckon a lot of my time is spent kind of either verbally out loud or just in my head going, ah, told you so, <laughs> told you so. You know, like you're going to try and carry a few different things in your hand, a cup and a bowl with a plate on top, and you're going to walk up the stairs and think that that's all going to go swimmingly well. Yes, 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 we'll see how that goes. You know, um, we go on a walk and it's like, you know, a good, a good day's walk. And you're like going, no, don't go in the puddles. Just if we stepped out the car in the car park, because I know what's going to happen. Halfway around, you're going to whinge and complain that you're cold and wet. And also when we get back, somebody, I don't know who, is going to have to clean all your clothes you've got totally caked in mud. You know, if you're going to decorate, say, for example, you know, and you're going to, you know, paint, what's really good is that if you put like, um, they've made this really good stuff that you can put down, uh, you know, they're called dust sheets, so it covers all the stuff, so nothing gets wrecked. But if you don't, then yes, paint's going to be all over the floor, it's going to be in my bag, because I don't know, you didn't even move the bag, and it's going to be everywhere. I find myself saying, you know, don't do that, don't do that, because I know that I... Generally speaking, I'm going to have to live in the consequences of the choices that you did or didn't make. A lot of the stuff that we walk through, a lot of the stuff that we face is not because of an unloving or an unjust or an angry God. It's because people make choices. People make choices. And we have to go through, uh, back to what I said in a minute about the fact that God gave us free will. He gave us free will so that we could love him. But it also means that we have free will to live our lives however we want. Let me just say, you can live your lives. Young people, you can live your lives however you want. Because God gave us the ability to have free will. However, he does say that if you do that, there are consequences to the choices you make. Every day there's consequences to the choices that we make one way or another. Um, and he says, this is, I've created this life. And if you follow my ways, if you walk in my footsteps, if you take my word, you can live a brilliant life. Everything can go well. In Proverbs 13, it says, whoever scorns instruction will pay for it. But whoever respects a command is rewarded. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. Good judgment wins favor, but the way of the unfaithful leads to their destruction. Everything we need for life is in the book, okay? Everything we need, how to do relationships, how to stay healthy, how to get the best out of life, how to parent, how to have a good marriage, it's all in the book. But people make choices. And unfortunately, people make bad choices. Choices that are selfish, choices that are greedy, choices that are malicious. I just think about a person who's probably had way too much to drink, who makes a selfish and a thoughtless choice to get in the car and drive home from the bar they've been in that night. 
The consequence of that is that somebody has an accident and that they have life-altering changes or at worst they lose their life because of a choice. I think about an unfaithful marriage partner who at some point makes a series of choices that they are going to just follow their selfish um, own personal pleasure. And on the other side of their choices, the consequence is, is that there's a spouse who is now left with a broken marriage to deal with. I think about somebody who's made a choice to live a life of a lie and greed. And on the other side of that is a consequence of a family who now has to work out financial uh, crisis. You see, we have choices. People can make choices. And Galatians says, my brothers and sisters, we're called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. So how much of our stuff and how much the the stuff that we experience or the people we know experience is actually down to the fact that people make choices. The good thing is, and we've sung it this morning already, uh, is that God is above our choices. That God is above our mistakes, our failures. When we mess up, he's also above the choices that other people make that are out of our realm of control, the consequences that we have to live with. But he's above those choices. And we read about in Romans that he can work all things together for good. We've already talked about that. So there's bad stuff, but there is a good God. Why does bad stuff happen? It's because people make choices. The third thing is this, is that bad stuff happens because the enemy is at work. There are two plans that are at work. And we know God's plan, we read it at the beginning, Jeremiah 29, our plans are for good and not for harm. They're for hope and a future. We love the verse John 10.10 10, where it says, Jesus came to give us life and life to the full. And we're like, yes, I'll take that. But there is a little bit before that verse. And this is the other plan that's at work because it says at the beginning of that, before we get to the good bit, it says that the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. See, God's at work with his plan, but also there is an enemy that is also at work with his plan. And the enemy is a liar. He's a deceiver. He's a stealer of our joy. He's a robber of our peace. He's a destroyer of our hope. He is at work. So why does bad stuff happen to good people? It's because the enemy is at work through our circumstances and through the people in our world. The truth is that God cannot do anything that's outside of his character, outside of his nature. God cannot create bad because he's good. He cannot create bad because he is a good God. However, God sometimes allows bad things to happen. And this isn't because that he doesn't love us. This isn't because he's bad. This isn't because he's uh, angry or he brings judgment on us. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's not because of that. It's because he has the greater plan in uh, mind. It's because of reasons that this side of heaven, we are never going to know. We are not going to know. You just have to read the book of Job to see this play out. Now, just a little recommendation. If you are having a bad day, if your alarm's not gone off and you've had to do the bus chase thing and you've got no milk or your hot water's broken, any of that, just pick up the book of Job, okay? Job is a really good leveler to go, okay, it's not so bad. Just a little bit inconvenient because here is a guy. And it talks about in the Bible that Job, he's a good man. He's a righteous man. He loves God. But what we see is that God permits the enemy to go to town on Job. And just over a course of a few days, this guy, this guy who's righteous, who loves God, he pretty much loses everything, okay? He loses his house and his home. He loses his kids. He loses his health. Job loses everything. And understandably, just like me and you, he's there experiencing all this loss and destruction and pain and suffering. And he's like, hey, God, any time right now would be good to come and rescue me. You know, what is going on? Why is this happening? And we would be in the same and we've been in those situations where we're like, God, what is going on? Why am I dealing with this 
again. Why is this not being worked out? Why is this happening to me? And I love God's response. Well, I don't know if I'd have loved it if I was Job, but I love it here reading it, okay? Because what God does is that Job's asking all these why questions and God basically responds to his questions of why by reminding Job of God's sovereignty. He talks about his attention to detail. God talks about his power. In other words, that God response, God's response to Job's why with a who. He says to Job, you know, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? In other words, you know, are you sovereign? Do you have the power that I have? Were you here when I created the whole of the thing? And he answers Job's questions of why with who he is. You see, often we want more answers and he gives us his love. We want more information and he just gives us his presence. We want more exclamation and God just gives us more of who he is and more of himself. You see, God, he knows the end from the beginning. God knows what he's actually constantly saving us from. We think we've got it bad, we're in trouble. Just think what God could be saving us from that we don't even know. He knows the bigger picture. He knows why he needs us to grow. He knows why he needs us to walk through certain things for the person that we're going to become because of what he's about to put before us. And so often we just want God to fix it. God, come and fix it. Come and instantly remove this pain. Come and instantly sort out this suffering. Come and fix it. But I want to say that your God is way more into forming you than he is into fixing you. He wants to form you into the person that he needs you to be. And I am so glad, church. I am so glad that he didn't just step in and fix it for Jesus. When Jesus says, hey, if there's any other way, can you, you know, if this cup can be passed from me, if you're willing See, this isn't a question when Jesus says this in the Garden of Gethsemane, if God, if God can. Jesus knows he's all powerful. Jesus knows that at any moment he can turn the situation around. So Jesus says, if you're willing, then let this cup pass me by, but not my will, but yours. I am so glad that God, who is a father watching his son go through something, didn't just come and fix it in an instant. Because if he'd have done that and thought, hey, no, I'm just going to fix it right here, we wouldn't be living in freedom that we have right now. We wouldn't have a future. We wouldn't have a hope. We wouldn't have life for all eternity with Jesus if God had just fixed it in the moment. I'm so glad that our God is more into forming us than into fixing us for the moment. And I think, you know, as you journey through life, there's, you go through these challenges, you go through these trials, and there's so many things that, you know, I've walked through personally, and I just think, you know, I, I still have the why, I still don't understand some things, but gosh, what I've experienced of God, of His love, of His goodness, of His kindness, I would never be the person that I am today if I hadn't walked through those things. I would never know what it is like to have the comfort of God if I'd never walked through those things. Why does bad stuff happen to good people? It's because the enemy is at work. The enemy is at work. But there is bad stuff and a good God. And the great thing that we can hold on to is that, just spoiler alert, God wins. Okay? So this life, for all the trial, for all the challenge, for all the suffering and the pain that we have to walk through, the good news is, is that God's already won. So this is just temporary, church. What you're walking through is just temporary. There's going to come a time and a moment where we're going to be in eternity with God, where there is going to be no more tears, where there is going to be no more pain, where there is going to be no more suffering. There is just going to be eternity with God. The fourth thing is this, and the band can come and join me. Bad stuff happens, but God is good. Psalm 119 verse 68 says this, You are good and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. God is good. The cross tells us, church, that God is loving. That he would send his son to earth to die on a cross to pay our uh, penalty that we should pay, there has to be a penalty paid. But instead of us paying it, he sent Jesus, his one and only son, to pay the price for us. So that 
the gap could be restored so that there could be no more brokenness, no more fracture between us and God. God is love. The cross shows us that. I want to say that God uh, does not judge you with pain. He doesn't judge you with harm and suffering. He does not judge you in that way because he sent his son. We now have a covenant of grace. So there is no need for judgment in that way. But in the same way that we can't earn our salvation through good works, we can't escape pain through good deeds. That there is stuff that we have to walk through. But God is good. You are good and what you do is good. See, God doesn't promise that we won't have pain and suffering, but He does promise that He'll be with us. Isaiah 43 Verse 1 to 2 says, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burnt. The flames will not set you ablaze. See, God doesn't promise to stop the fire. He doesn't promise to stop the water, but He does promise to be with you. He's not a far off God that you know, he distances himself, you know, he came to earth. He showed us that he is a God that wants to be with us, that wants to walk through the fire with us, that he wants to walk through the waters with us, that he wants to walk through us in the tough times, in the challenging times where we're going through pain and suffering. He wants to walk with us. And there's still so many questions of why and uh, I remember being in the, um, for many of you know, M- uh, Mark, my husband, he lost his mum and dad in a short space over a few years. And we were in the, uh, the funeral director's office after her, for the second time within a few years. His mum had just passed away. His dad had passed away a few years before. And I remember sitting in this room and it was a weird experience because I'm like, it just feels like we've blinked and we're back here in this place that I've never stepped foot in before. And now we're back here. Only last time we were sat here, you know, Mark and his two sisters and his mum was there and we were working out his dad's funeral. And now we're sat here, just me and Mark and his two sisters. And it was just the weirdest experience. And I just remember feeling like so, like, I guess angry and so confused. And I know, you know, we're all in our 40s, but gosh, in that moment, we felt like little kids who have just been orphaned by both parents. And I'm thinking, this feels so unfair, God. This feels so rubbish right now in this moment. And I remember just as they were discussing, you know, I guess his siblings, and I just sat there and my heart breaking for them and me thinking, you know, as a wife having to walk through this again after just a few years of already having done this and just saying, God, we need you. God, I'm going to need you like never before. I thought I needed you before, but now I really, really need you. How are we going to get through this? How are we going to get through this? And I just felt... God's just saying, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to be with you. And in that moment, again, I felt another fresh wave of 2 Corinthians 1. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. I think if I'm honest, before I've kind of had some big things to deal with in life, these are kind of just words on a page. You know, God, the God of comfort, that's great. You know, oh, great God, that's brilliant. But when you're in that moment, I want to tell you that God comes through. He is the God of comfort. And it doesn't matter what anything else the world can offer. There's nothing like the loving Father coming to comfort you in the middle of your darkest hour, in the middle of your uh, most painful moments. God is the God of comfort. He is the God that walks through the fire. He's the God that takes you through the seas. God is with you. And I've learned over time that it is so much better I don't know why, but I do know the who. It's way better to know the who than to know the why. And what I want us to do in a moment, and I guess this is just for life because there's people in this room and right now you are in this fire. You are walking through the water with stuff of life right now. 
But others of you, maybe it's been years ago and you walked through some fires and some waters and some challenges. But if you're honest, you're probably still carrying a bit of the residue. And maybe you're not there right now. Well, you know, I'm sorry, but Jesus says there will be trouble. So it's just good for the future for you to know. That what we have to do is that we have to bring our why to God. And what I've learned is that if I am so consumed with carrying the why, that I have no room or capacity to receive His peace. I have no room in my heart to experience His goodness. So what I've learned, I've had to do, other than staying in this just dark place of carrying the weight of the why, the weight of the anger, the confusion, that it's unfair, that if I carry that, I don't do anything but stay with that on me. And I've learned that also if I don't deal with it, it leaks into everything else in my life and the people in my world. But when I bring my why to God, almost as a place of an offering, God, I'm going to give you my why. I'm going to give you all the anger, the confusion, that it's not fair. Why me? All of that, the hurt, the pain. When I give that to God, I have space in my heart to receive His peace. I have space in my heart to experience His goodness to the fullness. So we have to exchange our why for His peace that gives us space to experience His goodness. Why don't we stand up? Thank you for listening to this Audacious podcast. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. We'd love for you to join us at one of our campuses, Manchester, Chester, or online every Sunday, 10 a.m. and 12 p.m.